Okay, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jill Clough, whose idea this was, and who is going to kick off this conversation. So Jill, I've got your slides, over to you. Thanks. Well, I think actually what was just being talked about, about deadlines before uh, some people came on the call, is very interesting, because one of the best things that was ever said to me was by Jackie Kay, and she said, the more constraints we have, the more original we're compelled to be. And I think that's a really interesting starting point. I wanted to raise it because there's so much cross fertilization on this call and so many creative people on it, and I wanted to hear more from them. But for me, this started back in the 1980s. Yes, thanks. I was in a school when design and technology came into the curriculum, and we had to work out how to fit it in with all the other school subjects, how to justify it. And it made us think when we were about teaching kids. So if you've got a piece of wood, for example, is it going to turn into a lamp stand, which would do in a technology environment, or is it going to turn into a, a wooden figurine, which would take place possibly in an art studio? And we had to work out what made sense of that. Much later, I came across this wonderful publication. It came out in 1999, but I think it's still current. And I've given you the um, website because you can download it as a, as a PDF. Um, and it was All Our Cultures was edited by Ken Robinson and it brought together all kinds of creators. They were largely thinking about education, but they were also thinking about a much broader thing. And I loved what I don't think I noticed before, which is creativity is national income, which it seems to me a wonderful starting point. Can you go to the next slide, please, Tom? So I won't read the whole thing, but I'll leave it for you because I thought it was absolutely emblematic of where ideas come from. Richard Feynman, working on quantum physics, decided he would do something for the fun of it. So he was sitting in his university cafeteria and the plate, this kid threw up a plate and the way the plate spun with a blue logo in the middle of it was absolutely liberating to Feynman, who suddenly saw his whole problem in the light of play and he came up with the proposition that turned into quantum physics for which he won the Nobel Prize. And that it was a completely unexpected place for an idea to have come from for him. Next slide, please. This is another one which really made sense to this, another sort of insert into this publication. This fashion designer, Helen Story, had a sister who was a developmental biologist and I'll just read the first bit. As I watched my sister from a distance in her own environment, I could tell her lab processes were not that different to my studio ones. In science at the bench, much as the potter at his wheel or the sculptor at his block of wood, there's a process of preparation, questions posed early on and a distinct feeling of grafting away until the result wins through. I thought that was a fantastic summary. Um, next slide, please. What was even more important, I thought, was this comment from Martha Graham, obviously talking about dance. It's unique. And if you don't get it out, if you, don't, if you block it, it won't exist in any other way. And I guess what she was thinking was that the form she chooses to express herself, dance, only permits an, an idea to be expressed in a very particular physical way. And if that's not available, then the idea is not going to emerge or it would have to emerge in a completely different form. So there's an interplay between the form you choose or you find available to you and the idea that you come up with. I also liked this comment from Lenny Henry, there are people who have to create to live and then there are others who live to create. And then there's the rest of us, and obviously he's talking about himself, but he seems to me a very creative person, who are creative but don't know what to do with it. And you think, I, I think these people could be nudged in the right direction by teachers. Next slide, please. When I, I this is a couple of words about the novels I write. I can't write a story. Stories come to me, anecdotes, experiences, but I have to get into the head of somebody. I can't write without I'm in somebody's head. And I was writing a story about a, a teenager exploring identity gender identity, other identity. And these four images actually occur in my book because they were things that I gave my character to look at. The one on the top left is a map of the internet. The next one is the Crab Nebula. Bottom left, it's a brain cell. 
right? It's Cyborg Man, based on Leonardo da Vinci. And all of those things I, I wanted to bring together as a part of the exploration. Last slide, because then I'm stopping. I've also been very influenced by childhood memories. I was given um, a book of English fairy tales illustrated by John Batten when I was six. These mythical drawings have inspired my next three novels. Two of them are out now. And it's this underpinning of myth, which for me enables me to get inside the story, the head of the protagonist when I'm writing and how, where they find their courage. End of me, over to Dan. No, it's Chris next. Is it Chris? Right, sorry, next. got that right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'll yeah. just yeah. shut up. I saw Dan looking very shocked there. Was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Jill. I mean, it, thanks for sort of letting me speak on this because I love this topic, uh, especially uh, consciousness, subconsciousness. That sort of uh, fascinates me. And um, yeah, I should say, if you don't know me, I live in Olverston, live and play and uh, make stuff under the name Artfly with my wife Jenny who's over the other side of the room on a different Zoom call. Um, yeah, and for me, oh, uh, Tom, can you show the, my slides there? But uh, yeah, for me, sort of ideas, sort of uh, a flippant thing, they sort of bubble up. They just sort of come up from seemingly nowhere. There's always, the, the way I think about it is if you're, like trying to remember an actor's name in a film or something, and you can't remember it, you get that tip of the tongue uh, sort of feeling, and you know you know it, and it's somewhere, that name is somewhere, and that's where the ideas live, down there, and suddenly it'll ping up, and that's to me is where the sort of ideas come from. So this, you know, encouraging ideas is, is kind of, you know, what it's all about for me, is how you get more ideas to ping up. And when Jill mentioned this topic, uh, I should say the two big sort of pictures there, these are uh, TED talks that it reminded me of, um, talking about ideas that I watched and like Elizabeth Gilbert has this great thing about, um, I can't remember quite how she phrased it, better than this, but sort of the idea gods living in the walls and sometimes they're with you and sometimes they're not. And it's sort of like taking the pressure off you, it's your job to sort of turn up. And if the idea gods are with you, they're with you if they're not they're not and that's not your concern it's just you've got to keep coming to the table and Amy Tan has the bit I took away from her talk is this idea of um, serendipity so when you're thinking about a project especially when there's a sort of brief or something to go for there's a point where you suddenly notice the world offering things up to you like for me I make sort of electronic things with uh, old cabinets and webcams and stuff like that and suddenly in a you know, a second-hand shop, there'll be a cabinet that's just perfect. And then I'll see online on Twitter, there's a bit of code that someone sort of released for free that just fits perfectly. And it's almost like the world wants you to make this. And Amy Tan, sort of, her idea is that you, you've you got to focus in on, you've got to notice these moments of serendipity and sort of follow them and sort of bring them in. So, yeah, um, talking about these ideas, when they come up, often 3 a.m. in the morning for me, I'll wake up and there's a sort of what I think is a genius idea which sometimes turns out to be terrible, but I write them on a big list. I think this is really important. On the sort of uh, right-hand side of that slide is my big list currently. I had to really zoom out. Uh, those are sort of each idea is a bullet point on that list. And it, this is like treating your idea um, with the sort of um, preciousness it deserves. So you're kind of almost telling your subconscious, yeah, yeah, I want more of this. Yeah, I'm going to put it on the list. Uh, give me more. They might be terrible, but I list them anyway. Uh, yeah, so next slide, please, Tom. So, yeah, I've got this massive um, list of ideas. Um, and But to sort of keep the ideas coming, it's kind of like this subconscious, I feel that there's, there's no direct communication. You can't look into it, but you can, you can pour lots into your subconscious and hope the, you know, this mysterious beast within sort of creates something for you and pings it up. Uh, so what I like to do is sort of anything that sort of um, catches my eye, whether it's on scrolling through on Twitter or in an art gallery or museum or just walking down the street, I sort of get interested in it. And it's not necessarily things to do with the stuff I create, but I sort of follow the white rabbits, investigate them and go off on tangents. And then this is only something I've started in recently is sort of 
making notes this is my sort of notes page i'll grab an image that reminds me of it and put it there so when i come to a sort of like barren patch of ideas i can sort of look through this and it will sort of give me inspiration which you know nothing is directly what i'll do but i might look at a puffer fish and that sent me down the white rabbit of the patterns on a puffer fish are actually created by something called diffusion reaction which also creates corals which that was mapped mathematically by Alan Turing, which he wrote out the formula and then somebody has taken that formula and used it to sort of generate patterns um, for use in sort of uh, films and TV. And you can take those patterns and and then you sort of go into sort of what if questions about sort of how to develop them. Yeah. So uh, next uh, slide, please, Tom. Yeah. So once you get the, these ideas and sort of thoughts, it's making and playing. It's, um, it's taking these ideas and just not leaving them as ideas, but just getting in there, making something really quickly and seeing where it goes. Now, I do a lot of code and often just very slapdash, bash out loads of code and make loads of mistakes. And those mistakes often end up better than the original ideas. So sort of following those mistakes along is, uh, you know, I, I find it's just sort of lucky happenstance. And... Every time I do an experiment, and this is something I'm terrible at, but I'm trying to document it because these little experiments I do that are kind of like just getting an idea out there to see if it's got any merit. I'm trying to sort of log and write up a bit, the boring bit that is always something we were just talking about pro procrastination before. Like this is the bit I don't like doing, but once I do it, I can look at this sort of page of things, little things I've made and think, oh, that will go really well with another project. And things like that so yeah i'm trying to get them down into something concrete yeah next slide please tom so yeah so it's all lovely uh, when amy tan you know you're in that world and the world's giving you everything and everything's going lovely and ideas are picking into your head but there's often times when that's not happening and that's what i call the grind when the grind works and this is what elizabeth gilbert talks about turning up so um, for me, turning up is I don't have any ideas. I'm questioning my reason for living and what am I doing? Is anything worthwhile? And it's all terrible, terrible. And that's the point when it's really hard to sort of step up and carry on doing things. The temptation is just to sort of ignore it and let it go away. Um, but no, you've got to come up, try. It's like I feel like it's panning for gold. You're just panning in the sludge and sludge and sludge and sludge. And eventually you'll get a nugget and then another nugget and that will build. And keeping track of past projects, I find is an excellent way of doing that. Because not only does it tell you, look, you, you do make things, you can do things, it's fine. It also gives you sort of stepping off points. You think, oh yeah, I like that people really reacted well to one particular thing and that I could take, isolate that bit and then sort of take that further and do something else with it. So it, yeah, produces more and more ideas. So yeah, I think that's my time up. I think it's over to Dan now. No, it's not over to Dan. It's going to oh, be sorry. Caroline. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> Before we do that, Chris, just while yeah. I keep showing the screen, just because it's something that I saw recently, that's yeah. in the top row there. If you can see five from the left, Dorothy Wordsworth School Pixel Portrait. Yeah. Now, I saw that emerge and become a beautiful Christmas decoration in the middle of Cottonmouth High Street um, uh, back, in, back in December. Just to use it as an example, what was the story of that idea? The, the, the kids were on the pixel portrait, the yeah. picture one. Yeah, How so the idea... you might want to explain to people that haven't seen it what it actually is. Yeah, so that is um, a Dorothy Wordsworth picture made out of tiny squares, and these each square is a uh, sticker that the kids put on. So I gave each we gave each kid sort of A5 uh, sheets uh, with numbers on. So like painting by numbers, they picked the right sticker and stuck it on the right bit, and then came up and added it to the big picture. Um, and slowly we built up a picture and we did actually four of these Dorothy Wordsworth pictures that form a, a giant sort of um, almost Warhol like picture with different things. So this came from actually looking into pixel art. Um, I was dead into spectrum computer games when I was younger. And one of the white rabbits I followed with this was I didn't realize pixel art was still going. So looking at very sort of blocky images and then um, with the play, I figured out how to turn an image into um, pixel art sort of quickly and then manipulate it. And I was interested in sort of uh, kind of 
changing how the pixels came together, so exploding them out from the center. So that was happened from an accident. So it feeds in very nicely to what I was saying, that I got it slightly wrong and the pixels didn't fit together, but it made a really lovely effect. And then, yeah, figuring out how to do that and then print out the sheets, the sort of um, the tricky bit, then bring it into reality, which is what we're bringing in later. But then, yeah, and then we've come and done that in sort of libraries and schools now, and it works brilliantly well. It's lovely. So kids can, especially kids, come together and they can create something and there's no barriers to it. So kids aren't put off because they can't draw or anything and they can all come together and make a giant picture. So, yeah. The thing of great beauty. Yeah. Excellent. Lovely. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Um, and I, I, when I'm sharing my screen, I can't see chat. So I'm about to nip into chat and see what's going on in there. But while I do that, I'm going to invite Caroline to introduce herself and uh, she has the floor for a few minutes to tell us about what she does as far as ideas are concerned. So Caroline, if you'd like to come off mute, Caroline Moore, and it's over to you. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm Caroline Moyer, <clears throat> and I've lived in Kendall for uh, about 45 years off and on. Um, uh, I'm a writer, but I have three hats as a writer. I'm a playwright, a novelist, and a short story writer. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, where my ideas come from in those three areas. Um, uh, my playwriting has largely been commissioned, so I have to work for, to the ideas of the commissioning person. Um, though, it's uh, there an exception was uh, when my uh, then there an exception was my play Lady Anne Clifford a woman cast out um, uh, when Kendall Community Theatre wanted a follow up to their passion play in 2012 um, they wanted a local follow up and the question was asked when I happened to be standing in Abbott Hall. Uh, looking at the triptych that was commissioned by Lady Anne Clifford, and she uh, reached out and grabbed me um, uh, by the short and curlies, as it were. So I did the research, but I ha still had to find a way in. Um, and when I found out that Lady Anne Clifford and my mother had the same birthdays um, and were equally as bloody minded as each other and had a portion for uh, installing modern kitchens in their castles and in my, my mother's case, their cottage. Um, I had a handle on the subject and I could then write it. I mean, the the research took about nine months and then I wrote it in a month. Um, um, as a novelist, um, I explore the why uh, <clears throat> why the uh, why the person acts like they do and what how it would be if. These, these two questions. Um, as a novelist, I explore a situation and a psychology and a speculation on an intellectual or moral question. Um, my first uh, degree was in philosophy and I have maintained that interest. Um, my first novel was based on a news item I heard where um, a woman was, uh, mounting a legal challenge uh, to uh, freeze her husband's dying husband's sperm to so in order she could in order to uh, to have his babies after his death and the um the question i thought about was what would the effect on the psychology of the children have um, and and their their dynamic as a family. So that was my first novel. Um, 
my debut novel, which is Brock and Spectre, which is published by a Victorina Pet Press. Um, the situation was I was being buttered up by uh, someone to get to my husband. Uh, it really irritated me, not that she was getting to my husband, but that she was buttering me up. And uh, I wondered whether you could write someone out of your life. So the, the situation was that, the question was whether you could write someone out of your life. And that came together in a novel that is um, uh, about a w one woman stalking another. Um, my short stories have uh, incidents from my own life and the places where they happened. Novels are open-ended and I really prefer writing novels. Um, short stories are closed and they tend to be circular. Uh, novellas are closed as well, but they, they don't tend to be circular in that, in that kind of way. Um, uh, so for example, um, when I was uh, between the ages of 14 and 19, I lived a quite considerable time in Syria. And in 2007, my husband and I went to visit Syria, revisit Syria. Um, and Nusaha, the short story, grew out of the incident when my husband lost his passport on the Pullman coach to Palmyra, which I really wanted to see. And the predicament and the half hour we managed to see um, after locating the passport, um, Palmyra, that, was, that, that gives it a flavor. I realized that the short stories about my in, the incidents in my life were not circular. And they were not circular because it's actually, <clears throat> the collection is actually a memoir in short story. So it's uh, open-ended in that way, but the whole collection is close-ended in a way um, novels aren't. All right, Caroline, can I just pause you there for a second? Um, thank you, it's really interesting to hear that your ideas are coming from obviously experiences, life experiences as much as any other places. I'm just looking at chat and I'm seeing that Colin's put there, I use dream incubation for my ideas. Colin, I'm intrigued by what you mean by that. Tell us a bit more about that. Come off mute, Colin. There uh, right, there we go. Uh, well, it started way back when I was at college. You know, like when you're first there and you get loads of different projects right at the beginning and you get sort of bombarded with it. And I was struggling with that. Um, but at the same time, uh, I was actually reading um, about lucid dreaming by Dr. Stephen LeBurge. And he comes up with a, a method of a dream, creating dream signs to help you when you're asleep. So you can create sort of dream signs to remind your subconscious to let you know that you're actually dreaming. So I was really getting into that. And I just thought, well, have a try and a twist on that and um, see if I can use it for my college work which I did. So one of the things that you do in, in that system, you create, you have a dream journal and you write everything about your dreams when you, when you have them, but you also write in at the beginning at the night, when you go to bed, you write, you basically write down what you want to dream about. And you can take that to a next level where you can create your bedside stand almost like a little alt altar to your dream. So if you want to dream about specific things, you could put those on your bedside table with your dream journal and your pen and a little torch, whatever you want. I mean, you can put photographs or whatever. And so I started using this technique when I was at college uh, and it works really, really well, uh, even to a point where I was actually getting stuff even before I fall asleep. So it's like um, I would just drifting off to sleep and then wang, 
I get suddenly get this image in my head. And then so I write that down in my journal, or sometimes I will sketch it, and then I go back to sleep, and then bang, there's another one. And so it's a really effective method. Um, but I should say at that time, I'd have probably been uh, looking into dreams and how to do lucid dreams for at least a year um, at that point. Um, so saying it's one of the things that is like loads and loads of people say, well, I don't dream. Well, yeah, you do. You're just not aware of it. So everybody dreams five or six times a night. Um, and it's just becoming conscious of that. Uh, and the starting, like, I create a dream, a dream journal, but then I keep a, a, a create a bar chart as to how many dreams I've had per night. And it does get so, a bit tiring when you actually wake up after every single dream and you've had five or six dreams in the night. <laughs> so you're working up, you know, bang, bang, bang. But they usually come in quite early in the morning. All right. Um, that's, that's great. Well, it's, I'm just trying to get us all out, thinking of different ways of where creativity and ideas come from. Mm. Colin, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. What a busy sleeping man you must be. Um, but speaking of busy men, let's talk, let's go, let's cross back to 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 Dan, Dan Fox. Caroline, do you want to say something? Sorry. Can I finish? Because I, I was interrupted. Um, uh, so to to um, sum up, my dreams come from uh, my, my well, I, I, I actually get stuff from my dreams, but I don't organize them. Um, I my ideas come from um, situations, incidents and exploration of psyche, psychology. And can you play my MP4 now? Because um, I've got an a event on in Workington on the 29th of uh, this month, uh, put on by Cumbria Libraries. And so this is the MP4 for the event. Thank you very much. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you. Let's cross to Dan, Dan Fox, who's also got some wonderful slides that I'm going to get ready to, to play out now. So Dan, over to you if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure, yeah. Hi, I've just moved inside because it suddenly got windy outside. I thought I um, didn't want wind on the microphone. Um, uh, so yeah, please, Tom, could you just go with the, the first slide? I'll just, I'm just going to do like old school slideshows talking over pictures. Um, so this, the, I'm based in Ulverston and I direct Sound Intervention, which is my company, which is basically me and then a bunch of sort of freelance, freelancer mates. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. Um, and I work on quite a variety of things, a lot with sound, um, installations, mobile sound systems, uh, mobile projections, uh, music, sound recording, um, making things out of sound that I record and creating installations in different ways to play them back. Um, and my background is in site-specific site theatre, um, so the black and white picture at the top is a, a company from Amsterdam that I worked with for several years called Dog Troop. And uh, also grew up working with, uh, well, grew up with Welfare State in Ulverston. Um, so I did a lot of sort of community things and have been playing trombone since I was about 10 years old. Um, next slide, please, Tom. Um, I thought I would, um, actually, sorry, Tom, could you go back again um, before I get onto this one? Um, I, a, a lot of this, the projects that we did specifically with the site-specific shows were, um, I thought that was quite an interesting starting point for this conversation because Dog Troop um, reacted to the locations in which the, the, the shows were made. So some 
what, for example, there's one show called The Nordwest of Waltz, which was in a dry dock in Amsterdam in the uh, early 90s. And um, it was a large scale show. It was performed to 2000 people a night for five weeks. Um, and it was sold out on the premiere, but the festival who booked the show um, had no idea what they were going to get for the show. And the company also had no idea what the show was going to be when it was sold. It's just they had a good reputation for making quality work and the, the festival had faith in them that they would make something good for this for this show so basically about 30 artists arrive on site to, to make this show and we we started saying well what shall we do what can we do and we would um have workshops in okay we've got water we've got we've got this landscape we've got acoustics we've got um, materials we've got um retired dock workers and so we would do uh, we would play with storylines and music and sounds and slowly these things we we would experiment with would start to um manifest themselves some things would work really well and would be developed some some things would be tried and would not work so well so we would leave them um to a to, to one side and with that company at one point in the year we used to do a thing called the labo laboratorium which was where we would um, spend several weeks um thinking about the shows that would be coming up that year so we did a really wide variety of things from playing on snow slopes at the winter olympics to expo sites in seville on water and um, shows on this dock show that i mentioned and um, touring shows and so we would sort of feed these things in thinking okay these are some of the areas we're going to be working in what could we do that would work in these contexts so so somebody would chop up a moped and make a motorized swan that could drive around at crazy speeds um, somebody would make up a piece of music for a new lineup of instruments somebody would make a new instrument whether it's like a double reed instrument or a drum um, and technology sort of making 12 volt battery light costumes that could go underwater and things and we would put all of these things together and then with an invited audience we would we would show them all of this this work and sort of get their honest feedback about it um and um the dutch you know communicate quite differently from from the english so i found it quite strange when i got that i would make something of like my here's my big thing i've made and presented to the to the company thinking it was great and then I would get all this criticism about it and I would take it very personally and be very hurt and thinking why are you having a go at me um, and then I realized actually no they're not having a go at me they're, we're, we're talking about this idea we want this idea to be better so we we are criticizing the idea so that we can develop it and and for me that was quite a learning curve and but then when I came back to England to work here and I'd sort of absorbed this technique and started talking in the same way in England, it just didn't go down well at all because in England you have to talk around in a big circle before you actually say what you want to say. And so the, the, the Dutch just kind of cut out all of that, all of that stuff really. And it just got to the, got to the kernel of what, what the, um, what, what the idea was and how to make it better. Um, I also find that um, quite a lot of the things I make are um, a response to stuff that I have. Um, so I'm kind of scratching around. A friend of mine once asked me, could I make a, a one man band for a one man band festival in Morecambe? Um, and I was like, mm, I don't I don't really think I could do a one man band. He said, go on, have a, have a go. So I went down into my cellar and a bit like the old car, the, um, cartoon of rhubarb and custard where he goes into his shed and you just hear a load of noise and random things I found some stilts and a drum and a I had an also ice hockey helmet I ended up with a drum on my head and a ladder on my back and I created this um, one man band a percussion one man band on stilts in the end and um, ended up doing that for like three or four years and getting loads of gigs with it but I, I would never have thought of that idea had I not been given that sort of context to try and create um, that, that, that thing for at all. Um, and, then, and then there's the worrying about is the thing that I'm creating any good? Um, having done quite a lot of compositions of music myself, I used to really worry about what will other th people think about this? Will they think it's rubbish? And, and that would sort of have all this, this self-doubt about how, how good is it. And then at a certain point, I just said, you know what, I like it. And um, 
if somebody tells me it's crap, then okay, that's that's fine. I can deal with I can deal with that, or I can change it, or I can think about it. But actually, over time, people didn't say that, and and they liked it, and it so that that led to me having more inner inner confidence in my own work and not actually worrying about what other people would think about it and for me that that was quite a big thing thing to get over um so i thought um i would just go through next slide please tom um this this is a project i just thought would be i'd talk specifically about one project about how that came about how the ideas came and then how the ideas might have developed so this was a commission for Oxford Contemporary Music for a, a, a touring installation called or, for Audible Forces, which was seven sound artists working together, all making pieces that were played acoustic, played by the wind, essentially. So, so my piece was called Howling Wire. And when I was asked to make this piece, I'd never made any, um, I'd made instruments before that you might hit or tune percussion and things like that, but I'd never made any um, Aeolian instruments. So I, I, it was a whole period of doing a lot of research and a lot of experimentation um, to find out various techniques that I could use to turn movement of the wind in, into sound. Um, so I came up with this piece, which is based around this large, large mast. And on the left hand side, you can see these um, things with the silver cups on, which are actually uh, IKEA salad bowls and skateboard bearings, um, which are which I called anemomophones, which are re revolving um, flutes. Next slide, please. And I used um, drums with vibrating straps to create tones. Um, so these drums are actually made out of um, extraction ducting um, because I, I found some and it happened to be an imperial size and I realized, oh, it, it's, it'll fit an existing drum head. And the drum on the right actually came out of the Barrow shipyard. It was the shipyard band's timpani. They got digital timps and they got rid of these. So this had been kicking around for years, cleaned it all up and then made this bridge in the top of it and turned it into an aeolian harp next next slide please um and you can see the wooden bridge there at, at the bottom um but this wooden this wooden bridge and this aeolian harp came from a mixture of internet internet research and having an old bass drum and making holes in it and stretching it and spending a lot of time out in on windy hills getting freezing cold trying to make something um make make a noise um Next, please. Um, and then the, after that tour, um, I started making more Aeolian things. So these are actually up at Grisdale Forest. These are bamboo. And this is a very traditional thing. I mean, this idea has actually been around for thousands of years. It's just I managed to find a, a bamboo Im importer in Nelson, of all places, and um, uh, created these. Next, next please. Um, and then I was asked to if I could create some uh, Aeolian installations with children. I was like, how how would I do that? Because these were nursery school children, and I wasn't sure how they were going to make anything. And I only had like one day to work with them. So I took in some of my instruments and showed them to them, set them up in the in the school playground, and we had to listen to them. And then I asked them, could they draw the sound of the wind? Um, and this is what they came up with. Um, so I used um, their drawings. Next, please. Um, um, oh, sorry, that should, that's erroneous. Next slide, please. Um, um, and converted their, I think I've got a bit out of sequence. Um, uh, converted their drawing, put their drawings on, basically etched them onto those bamboo poles that you saw earlier on. Um, and use those um, as their reference points to the sound. These were, I've put these in because these were made of uh, basically overflow pipe and um, corex. Um, these actually, although they look very lightweight, these survived a 58 mile an hour gale in the west of Ireland. Um, and I really liked some of the techniques, particularly this anemomophone. Um, next, please. Um, oh yes, this is, sorry, this is the, this is the children's drawings put onto the instruments. And then for three or four of these schools, we had this Aeolian sound weather station garden, which was installed. And actually they're still there, They've been there about four or five years now. Uh, next, please. 
um, I, then this year I was asked to make a, a set of touring Aeolian instruments for a project called Green Space Dark Skies, which is part of Unboxed 2022. So um, I used my experience and sort of things that I wanted to develop from those previous instruments, like you can see the anemomophone there and the timpani harp, but instead of needing that big mast, I wanted it to be freestanding. So I sort of fed my learning from what I developed from those. And then next, please. Um, created these instruments which have um, lights attached to them. Uh, they're all acoustic and they're freestanding and they sort of break down so that they can be toured in, in a van without me needing to be there with without specialist knowledge. So uh, I think I just wanted to present that because it was a mixture of the initial opportunity to make the inst instruments, the, the learning process and working with what I had around me as well and then once I'd worked on these techniques of sort of logging them like Chris was doing, I, I don't really necessarily write everything down as just it sort of jumbles away in my brain somewhere. Um, and then, but when this opportunity this year came to make some, some more, I was like, well, I really wanted to develop that and I'd sort of parked that idea so that I was able to bring that idea out again and take it forward. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think that's me. It's fast. Great images. Great images, Dan. Um, as Eleanor says, this is amazing, Dan. I love the representations of the wind. I love how you've used the children's ideas and somehow converted those little drawings in that one day in that nursery school to, to full, fully flung machines and objects. Um, I also was interested to hear about, you know, the confidence thing, the inner confidence about trusting your instincts and things. Sod what Evan else thinks. You get to that tipping point, I guess, as well. Right, this is um, Sarah Jane. This is super inspiring. Thank you, everyone. What a nice comment to make. Um, we've got 15 minutes left, so I'm just going to hand over to whoever wants to chip in. This is now a free for conversation. Um, I'm going to just let you say what you want, and I'm going to go back onto mute. Um, I'm just quite interested in what's come up in the chat, and there was quite a few comments earlier on about um, sort of things going on at school and college and university, and sort of the idea of you've got your creativity, your ideas that are here bubbling away in your subconscious or wherever, but then you've got external forces kind of, <clears throat> and internal forces beating them down, so sort of your own inner critic um, and then, you know, maybe if you've been criticised in a certain way at school or college and that kind of thing, and then you sort of internalise that. So you've got your ideas, but then you've got these forces that are trying to kind of submerge them. And, you know, how do you overcome that, really? Which I'm sure Eleanor probably has some um, some thoughts on. <laughs> Go on, Eleanor. Yeah, um, so that was kind of what I wanted to talk about, to hit the microphone, which is... Um, that everyone's had these really incredible stories to share about how uh, inspiration comes to them. What I'm really interested in is working with the people who are struggling to connect with their inspiration in some way. So that might be because they weren't supported in childhood, so they don't have that inner confidence to experiment and express themselves. But also, you know, the other end of the spectrum, people who went through this school system and developed that powerful inner critic who won't let them create freely, or artists and makers who have like become so used to their creativity being something that they need to create for money. There has to be like a production element of it for survival. And so I guess what I'm really drawn to is like how, if we think of inspiration as something that always comes from an external source, so like that kind of flash of lightning, the idea hitting us or something that just intuitively appears from within us, which is what a lot of us experience right that's how we as artists and creatives connect to our inspiration but it sort of sets up this precedent that you either have it or you don't have it so for somebody who doesn't have access to it it can be really demoralizing because they're like well my mind isn't coming up with these ideas I don't know how to get them started and so particularly like when we look at the external kind of restraints upon us like have we got the energy have we got the time to give ourselves space I just started thinking about well, what about inspiration as a practice or like a like a skill that we can build so very briefly for me that was about connecting with nature when I was like at that all time like low of I just the ideas aren't coming now and <laughs> where have they gone and I'm tapped out 
it was connecting with nature but I think you know we're all individuals and it comes to us and there are ways that we can open that door in different ways but I would say from 15 years of working with kids what I've seen is that they have more access to that way of being and I think probably that is about encouraging and like creating a uh, opportunities in our life or kind of mental spaces and physical spaces where we encourage creativity through like curiosity and wonder and play like Chris talked about creative play so that's kind of what I've been thinking about it but I'd be really interested to know what other people think George do you want to pick up George you've got your hand up thank you Eleanor yeah I just wanted to pick up what Eleanor was saying there because I had a thought earlier that in, in, inspiration for me sometimes is like a collision of thoughts and there's a sudden spark of something. But equally, I was this thing about inspiration. I liked the, the fact that William Stafford, his poetry I really like, uh, used to get up early every morning. I think it was for 20 years. And he used to write a poem every morning when he got up. And he said, forget about whether it's good or bad. Forget about what anyone's going to think about it. Just write your poem. And it was interesting because I thought, yeah, in a sense, inspiration is great, but some of it is actually just doing it. And the more you do it, the better that in some ways, the more you open those paths to inspiration. It's a kind of a circular process, if you know what I mean. The more you do it, the better you get at suddenly recognising the things that inspire you. Thanks, George. Chris, and then Dan. Yeah, I was just uh, following on from Ellie and, and George just saying. It just, it it pains me when you watch, watching my kids sort of get really into art when they're in primary school, making things, making things, and slowly that inner critic and outside people sort of saying, oh, that's no good. And yeah, I, I, I'm very interested in this idea of getting things out there and how to encourage that. It's it feels to me sometimes you go around an art gallery and you'll think it's a very serious thing and you've got to be this creative genius and that is very separate from when you're starting out and this is sort of middle ground celebrating the sort of uh just making something there was a there was a woman on youtube um i forget her name but she called herself the queen of uh, shitty robots she made things intentionally badly and she just got them out there and now she's making sort of amazing robots but it's this whole thing of just instead of having this idea and you're so scared to release it to the world you never ever do anything and I'm very interested in how we encourage that because I think the national curriculum is doing a terrible job with creativity and how like if Ellie probably has the ideas of having these sort of safe spaces to sort of say it's fine having galleries full of kids art I love kids art when it's sort of very young and celebrating it uh yes yeah, so there's more just a sort of observation and a uh, and I think particularly uh, fundamental, but yeah. 120 weeks ago, these Friday morning calls were just an idea. We thought we'd give it a go, see what happens. And here we are 120 weeks later. Um, Dan and then Andrew. Um, yeah, uh, well, George saying about this guy writing a poem poem every morning, I sometimes find when I'm practicing the trombone, you sort of have these muscle muscle memories and the same things keep coming round again. And it's quite hard, sometimes like, how do I get in some inspiration for a, a new tune or a new a new a new melody and sometimes i find like if i pick up an instrument that i've never played before um i, I might have a, an inkling about the, how you know how might you go about play it i'll play it awfully but because i have no muscle memory with it something fresh will come out and i find that quite interesting of like just trying something that i've never done before or just something new it might lead to nothing or it might inform the other instrument but it's just a yeah, you know, just there's the rehearsal, there's a the practicing to get the technique, but sometimes you get limited with your own cycle. So jumping out into something else helps, sometimes, I think, sometimes. Andrew. Um, yeah, there's too much stuff going on in there. I, I agree with, I obviously agree with so much what, what's being said. Um, and it's a question we don't ask enough. Um, and I was asked whether I'd, I'd present something for this, this session and fell apart at the first hurdle. Um, doing what we do as human beings, which is to question too much and, and wonder whether why we're talking about creative ideas rather than ideas, um, because you only become 
creative when somebody does something with them. Um, the ideas in themselves are not creative, uh, they're just ideas. Um, and there's this issue, issue, one of the things we've been talking around is the stuff that doesn't get paid for by commissioners, by organisations, this essential element of, of what we do as artists, but also what we do as as human beings, this notion of play, there needs to be more play in offices, there needs to be more play at BAE, um, because it's that element of play and the willingness to fall over and pick yourself up and maybe bump into something and have a laugh because you bumped into it, like children do, that is really missing. And in this push towards efficiency, we're losing the things that um, from which the well, from which all of those um, useful um, ideas and useful um, interactions come. Um, and I'll just say, well, I could talk about this all day, but I'll just say one more thing around, um, no one's mentioned STEAM this week, so I'll mention it because, you know, it's one of my big things. Um, it's the root of all of that, that notion of, of creati creativity, which is, which is useful to the economy. Um, and the root is this, this ability to recognise patterns in the world, to play with them, and to put them together in a way where you, like I said from Brian Eno, where you, you, you honour your mistakes as, as hidden intentions. Um, and Chris said, you know, about the education system, it really is letting our children down, where we push towards this notion that there's some notion of perfection and um, success, which forgets that most of our activities as human beings end in failure. Um, I mean, just getting up in the morning and, and, and convincing yourself that you should get up and get dressed and do something with you there is an immense um, creative act because it implies that you think that that's worth doing and something will happen during that day. Sorry, I'll get off my... <clears throat> anyway, it's been a lovely morning. <laughs> Sorry. Andrew, you're always full of wisdom, though, which is a beautiful <laughs> thing and, and a special <laughs> thing in itself. Um, oh, we're going to sum up... Uh, Jill's going to start very shortly, but Fliss, if you can squeeze in your thoughts in about 30 seconds, that'd be great. Just wanted to say, I think the idea that one of the values of art and play and so on is that it's productive in the end is a mistake. We should start by saying we don't need to be productive. The less productive we are, the less consumptive we are, the better. And doing things like art and play is the least harmful thing we can do. And it gives us lots of stuff and not stuff, not physical stuff. It doesn't use physical stuff. It makes it's worth doing for its own sake. And that's why kids do it so well. Yeah. Thank you, Fliss. Jill, where are we at? What have we learned? Do we need to learn anything? In fact, this has just been a great discussion. Well, you're going to have to judge. I've got pages and pages of the wonderful things that people said. And the things that have come out strongly in common. I do urge you to download that PDF of all our cultures. I urge you to go back to Lenny Henry. We are all, we, the creative is in all of us. We all have that capacity. I love the idea of ideas in the subconscious canopies or the idea of gods in the walls, the idea of cauldron, the laboratorium. Lots, several of you said similar things, but you came at it from quite different angles. And what I was really interested in was the, number of different devices that people use actually to turn up. So you, ha you have whatever you have, the idea, but then something has to happen with it. And it's not to be productive for any other reason than because we love to make it. And me, I love to, I feel driven to write. I can't not sit down and write stories. Who, and I just want readers, I don't even want to be paid. I, I'm fortunate I don't have to be. Um, the, I love the idea of lucid dreaming. I'm going to give it a go. Um, the, the whole I'm going to watch that Elizabeth Gilbert uh, uh, TED talk. I I wondered listening to Dan talk in particular, but and also Chris about whether we could develop some kind of collaborative work ourselves. I don't know how many people collaborate with others, but several of you have talked about collaborations you've done with other people. I've found this whole network absolutely inspiring, and so there's that, and the whole notion of not attending to the inner critic, not allowing ourselves to be, but thinking that the mistake is part of the process and it's to be enjoyed. I love that comment about falling over and laughing because that's what kids do. And one of the things Lenny Henry said, he thought that teachers could help 
but I think that this, these, you are all, we are all teachers in our way, not explicit sitting down in classrooms, but actually working with others. And as, as Colin just put into chat, mistakes can be happy accidents. I, I'd better stop, Tom, but I, I, I've written pages. Excellent. I've got well, so much out of that. Well, thank you, Jill, for coming up with, with an idea for a conversation in the first place. It's been a really interesting hour, actually. Um, yes. Thank you to everybody who's contributed. Can I just turn your heads in the last minute of this call? Can I just turn your heads to next week? Because we're sort of changing gear slightly for next week. And the question we're looking at next week, uh, in a, on a slightly longer call, probably go through to 11 o'clock um, uh, next week, is does the Cumbrian arts and culture sector represent and serve all communities across the county? If not, how can we do better? So this is looking at one of the Arts Council investment principles um, about um, accessibility and how we can make sure that inclusivity and relevance takes place as much as possible. So this is practically speaking, if you do an Arts Council funding application, you might want to think about inclusivity and relevance because it's one of their four pillars of investment principles. But actually, it's the right thing to do. And how do we do it in Cumbria? What could we do to do it better? We're going to do two parts of this. We're going to have a face-to-face -face meeting in September at Rose Hill uh, near Whitehaven. But next Friday, we're going to kick it off with some examples across Cumbria that are taking place already with organisations, artists who are working hard to make their art and their culture as, as inclusive and as relevant as, as possible. So do look out for a little note in the newsletter about that this week and on social media. Same place, same time, same place next week. So Friday morning at 9.30, probably going on for a little longer. It's probably, Monique, going to be the 16th of September, but that's not confirmed, um, the date for the face-to-face for the -face at Rose Hill. So inclusivity and relevance, looking at that next week. But for this morning, thank you to Jill, Chris, Caroline and Dan in particular for kicking this all off, but loads of contributions around the house as well. Um, I look forward to seeing where this conversation continues to. And thank you once again to Jill for coming up with it in the first place. Have a lovely, sunny, warm, maybe hotter down south, might be nicer in Cumbria weekend and uh, catch you all again very soon. Lovely to see you all. Bye bye.